Hello everyone and welcome to another game from round 3 of the Prague Chess Festival, the Masters Division. We said that we were going to check out at least one more game since there were a lot of decisive games before we check out the standings. Uh, it's uh, Santos Gujarati Vidit uh, versus uh, Austrian Grandmaster Markus Rager uh, who won the Austrian Championship three times and is uh, the first uh, Austrian player to ever cross uh, the 2700 threshold. Uh, I don't know if there are any others so I'm pretty sure he's not only the first one, he's the only one. Uh, but still, uh, de definitely a strong player. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's check it out. Now uh, it's gonna be a, it's a, it's a pretty long theoretical struggle. Uh, but uh, what what game today isn't? Uh, so with the white pieces, d4 from Vidit. We have knight to f6, uh, c4, g6, knight to c3, and d5. Uh, the Groomfield defense is on the board. Uh, we have c captures, knight captures, and e4. Going for the main line, knight captures, b captures, and bishop to g7. And well, bishop to c4 is the most uh, played move here. We have bishop to e3, also a very popular line. C5 attacking the center, making use of this uh, beautiful uh, dragon on G7. Knight to F3, strengthening D4, and Queen to A5. Now pinning the C3 pawn again with ideas of capturing on D4. So Queen D2. Now uh, the C pawn is no longer pinned, and the Knight to C6, putting more pressure on the D4 pawn. And here Rook to C1 was the go-to move uh, up until this year, uh, it would seem. So now Rook to B1 is the move. Uh, people are playing in 2020. Uh, we have a6 and only now rook to c1. Now why this is so, uh, I'm sure it uh, required a lot of um, uh, opening analysis and uh, you know uh, asking the, the engine for advice but uh, it seems that this is the way it, it's played today. And okay c captures on d4, c captures, this was all played before, we have a queen trade, captures, captures and now e6, uh, not allowing d5. We have bishop to d3, continuing development, and now castles. Uh, and now rook to c4 uh, is was the, the idea here. Uh, you just play rook c4, you bring the other rook over to c1, you double rooks on the c file, uh, which is the only open file on the board for the moment. And it does make sense. But here, instead, we have h4. Now, perhaps with ideas of making some weaknesses here, opening up the, uh, the file for the rook by pushing h5, so h6. And now there is one game where e5 was played, so you kind of numb down the, the uh, bishop on g7, and also there is one game where h5 was played. But here, rook to c5, uh, and it is now as of move 16 that we have a completely new game. So let's see uh, how uh, Marcus deals with it. Uh, we have rook to d8, developing the rook, and also adds a third attacker to the d4 pawn. And now, uh, while well, you could try and defend it, maybe go back rook to c4, but it doesn't really make sense since you already said that you're not interested in rook c4, you want to play rook to c5, so rook to b1. And here, this is what Vidit obviously prepared, uh, Marcus now has to decide whether you grab the pawn or not. So let's see what happens if you grab the pawn. If knight captures on d4, let's say everything is traded, knight captures, bishop captures, 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 and now you get king to e3. You attack the rook, you get out of the pin, rook back to a4, attacks a2, and now rook to c7 is very strong. So black is up a pawn, but white has uh, insane activity. Uh, it, it will be very hard for, for black to develop. Uh, for example, if you capture rook c1 just wins the game, uh, since you, you cannot save the bishop, you, if you go here, the rook just captures it. There's no uh, defending the piece. So what you would have to do after rook to c7 is not capture, but play something like e5, uh, free some squares for your light square bishop to be developed. But then you get bishop c4. Now you go after the f7 pawn. And after, let's say, this captures, captures, you're going to capture on b7. And only, only white can be better here. Uh, it, or it's just a plain draw, for example, uh, rook checks, you move the king, you capture here, and then let's say you just continue checking up and down, and if white doesn't want to part with these pawns, you, we might have a draw by, by repetition. So this is basically what lurks in the position after this rook to b1 idea and offering of the d4 pawn. So uh, Marcus decides against it, we have bishop back to f8, now uh, forcing the rook to move back, rook to c4 now, uh, defending the d4 pawn and bishop to d7, just continuing development, uh, offering uh, the, the b7 pawn, but not really. If rook captures, then knight a5 just picks up uh, one of the rooks, so don't want to do that. 
Uh, so rook to b6, a very active move, uh, asking black how will you continue development. So bishop back to e8, now freeing up the d-file for the rook, and now uh, rook back to c1. Now uh, already there's the threat of rook captures because you no longer have this very nice fork. Uh, and here bishop to g7, again adding a third attacker to the d4 pawn. And while you could now maybe even go for rook captures on b7, and then again we trade everything, captures, 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 and captures, uh, rook to c3, bishop to b5 is the threat now going after the bishop here, but after rook c3, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty equalish game. So, uh, Vidit decides against it, he pushes e5, he says, okay, now uh, you are no longer attacking the d4 pawn, this bishop is now uh, much weaker than it was, uh, and your b7 pawn is still hanging. And now rook 8 to b8, just defending the pawn, uh, seems to be one of the ways for black to go, uh, but Marcus against, uh, again goes uh, for a more active approach, bishop to f8. Uh, he gives up the pawn for some very active ideas, uh, or, or so it seems. Uh, rook captures on b7, and now knight to b4. Uh, attacking the bishop here, also the a2 pawn is under attack. If you allow captures, then bishop to b5 check will be very strong. Black will have won the bishop pair, and maybe even uh, uh, tie down this rook, so, so it won't be able to escape. Uh, but uh, we'll see. So first bishop to c4, not allowing captures or grabbing of the pawn on a2. Uh, we have bishop to c6, now uh, putting the bishop to this very nice diagonal, rook back to c7, and now bishop to b5. Uh, we have bishop back to b3, again keeping an eye on your a2 pawn, and now knight to d5. Now going after uh, the bishop on e3, and now bishop captures on d5. It's 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 too strong uh, uh, of a knight to be just left there, bishop to a3 is coming, and uh, well, th this rook just might run out of squares. So, uh, we have bishop captures on d5, uh, rook captures on d5, and now rook to c8. Uh, asking, do you want to trade here? And then I get the other rook over to c8. So, of course, uh, Ragar doesn't. We have rook to d8, and now rook captures on a8. We have rook captures, and now uh, you might uh, have some problems. For example, if you go for the seemingly active rook to c7 right away, uh, black can just force a draw here, because the, the two bishops will will have no problems harassing the rook. Just rook, bishop b4 check, king c2 and bishop to a5 will make uh, quick work uh, of the rook. Uh, you don't want to go here, because then you allow the c file for, for the rook, which will come with check. So, rook to c5 if you want to keep the c file, but now bishop b6, and you can just uh, keep uh, merrily harassing the rook. Rook c5, bishop b4 or b6, doesn't matter. Uh, basically a draw by repetition. So after this uh, rook captures an 8, we have bishop to f4. Here Vidit frees the e3 square for his king. Uh, so let's see what happens. King to g7, uh, also black improves the position of the king, keeps an eye on the h6 pawn, so the bishop now can be developed. Uh, now rook to c7, and now bishop to b4 check. But now it's not a problem since you can move. Uh, king to e3, and now any bishop to a5 harassing of the rook will be met with rook to c1. So that's, that's a big difference here. So rook to d8 instead, uh, and now g4. Uh, we have rook to d7, now uh, offering a rook trade, but rook to c8. Since white controls more space, of course he doesn't want to trade down. Uh, we have a5 starting to push the pawn, and now bishop to g3. Uh, slowly making room for this pawn to be pushed to f4. Uh, bishop to a6, uh, pushing the rook back, rook back to c2, and now bishop to b7, just assuming this very nice diagonal. Knight to g1, freeing uh, the, uh, the, the, the f3 square so you can push f4. We have g5 and now f4. Uh, we have g captures on f4, bishop captures, and bishop back to e7, going after the h4 pawn, and now not bishop back to g3, but rather uh, uh, pawn to h5. So, uh, grabbing even more space. Uh, we have bishop to a6, uh, just waiting to see what white will do. Uh, white goes back, knight to f3. And it seems that the best idea for black is just to go back, bishop to b7, and keep uh, keep playing this game, asking white to come up with a plan. Uh, but uh, Marcus decided to go for another active idea. He played bishop to b4 instead, uh, and now, uh, well... Uh, a very important square was left behind, but feel free to pause the video and try to figure out what you would play here. How would you continue this position? Uh, while I give you a couple of seconds. 
So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on spotting the square that was left behind. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, uh, it's g5. The bishop from e7 no longer helps with the defense, uh, so of course uh, g5. And now the knight can come to g5 and from g5 to e4 and from e4 to d6. And it's basically just a, a chain reaction. So h captures, we have knight captures. Uh, and now bishop back to b7, which is an excellent square for the bishop, but now knight to e4, saying that I don't care if you capture here. If you capture, I'm just going to capture, and my position is just much better. I, I, I control the only, well, it's not the only, the, the g file is also open, but uh, I'm the one who controls the open c file. I have a passed h pawn. I'm just going to play h6, bring the rook over here, bring the rook to g7. It's going to be, it's going to be a fairly easy game for me. So instead, after knight to e4, bishop back to e7, not allowing the knight to come to f6, or d6 for that matter, but uh, doesn't work. Knight to d6 is just the same. Now, uh, of course, it's an excellent square for the knight. You, you are always pressuring the bishop. If you capture, then it's, well, you, you just have two passed pawns. Uh, rook to c7 is coming. There's no, no defending against this. So bishop to d5 instead, uh, but now h6 with check. We have king to g6, and here... Of course, you cannot play rook to here because the bishop covers that. So rook to c1 now, making room for rook to g1 to be played. And it was, uh, in fact, in this position on move 46 that uh, Marcus Rager resigned the game uh, as there is nothing more to be done here. For example, uh, we could show, let's say you try to uh, r r r relieve some of the pressure. For example, you will not capture right away. You're still going to go rook g1 check, king h7, rook g7 check. The h pawn is nicely guarded. King here. And now capture and you have a lot of, uh, well, you, you now have two passed pawns and it's hard for black to find the move. For example, if bishop c6 guarding the rook, preparing f6 to trade the rook, you have this very nice breakthrough of d5, freeing uh, some squares for the, for the white king. E captures, you're going to go king to d4, and now, yes, you will be able to trade rooks, but now king c5, saying that if you capture, I'm going to capture with check, and then pick up your bishop here, so bishop to a4, and now king captures on d5, and while you can now finally capture here, it's it's insufficient, because king e6, and now the, uh, the, the d pawn wins, black will have to give up the bishop here, and because you still have the a2 pawn, it's of course a winning position, and if you don't go for this trade, uh, instead, after rook to c1, you could try something else, but uh, the, there, there's not much better. If king h7, you're still going to go rook g1 and go for this g7 square. Bishop to f8 defends this, but now knight to e8, and there's no defense. Knight f6 seems to come with, uh, with a fork. Uh, and there's no uh, way of avoiding everything. For example, if you move the rook, it's just knight f6 check, king h8, and the rook to g8 mate. So whatever you do here, it's completely lost, and of course, uh, it, it's justified that Marcus resigned here. And an excellent victory for, for Vidit in round three of the Prague Chess Festival. So uh, let's check out the standings after three rounds here. No, those aren't the standings. Let me just, um, I have to load them. Okay. Yeah, these are the standings. Uh, so let's just check it out after... After three rounds, it's Vidit in first place with two and a half out of three points, followed by Nikita Vityugov, uh, Alereza Firuja, and Jan Kshistov Duda with two points. With one and a half, it's Nils Grandelius and uh, David, David Anton Giharo. Uh, and with one point, Marcus Rager, Pentala Hare Krishna, Sam Shankland. And with only half a point, which is, well, someone always has to have, have a bad start, David Navarra, uh, who, who is uh, the, the, the favorite as he's, you know, play, playing on home turf. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's uh, the game. I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Shamin Asfak, uh, Andrew J. Davis, uh, Austin Laird, uh, Dennis uh, Stachnik, and Mohamed Reza Rezai for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. As usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you for watching, and I will see you soon. Continuing the coverage of this very nice uh, Prague Chess Festival, continuing the uh, Morphe Saga, and of course, checking up on your wonderful suggestions. So thank you all. I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your weekend.